live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. All right, everybody, let's get started. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Welcome to our Daily Planet Cafe for our weekly Thursday night show, The Science Cafe. Who likes science? Who likes cafes? That got everybody, so I think we're going to have a good time tonight. I'm so glad there's so many people out here tonight. Uh, how many of you heard about the event from Facebook? I'm just curious. A few folks. How many of you are here every week no matter what? Doesn't matter what. It's okay. That's what I thought. Yeah, I know those hands too. Well, I'm glad everybody's here. Uh, tonight's going to be a pretty cool night because we're going to talk about some very special, very interesting insects, and we've got an expert on these critters, but also coming up, starting right now, and then all the way through 7 p.m. on Saturday, this museum is all about the bugs. Saturday, September 21st, from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., is Bug Fest. Anybody been to Bug Fest before? Yeah, that's great, right? It's North America's largest single-day celebration of all things bug. Uh, the theme insect this year happens to be beetles, of which tonight's uh, special guests, our fireflies, are in the group. If you didn't know that, I actually did not know this. Fireflies are beetles? Did you know this? Okay, you're nodding your head like, yeah, you're like, Chris, how did you not know that? You love science, what's up? Anyway, I learned that recently, and I think that's pretty exciting. And we're celebrating beetles. There are more than 400,000 species of beetle on Earth. And at Bug Fest this year, we're sort of pulling out dung beetles as a little bit of an extra special treat for the theme. But beetles all the way around for Bug Fest this year, more than 100 games, crafts, activities, and special exhibits across both buildings of the museum, Jones Street, the Pedestrian Plaza, and Edenton Street, all going to be shut down for Bug Fest. Basically, if you're not here on Saturday, I don't know what else you've got going on, because this is going to be the place to be. Tomorrow, Friday, at 11 a.m., in the first floor atrium of the Nature Research Center, just right behind me, we're going to be having the Bugfest Critter Cook-Off. I've got chefs from Zwelli's Kitchen in Durham, a Zimbabwean restaurant, and Y Hill Kitchen and Brewery here in Raleigh. They're going to face off Iron Chef style to see who can cook the best bug-filled dishes. They have to make an appetizer, an entree, and a dessert using mealworms, crickets, and beetles. You all are more than welcome to come and attend and watch the Critter Cook-Off. We've got celebrity judges who will judge the food, and we will award the 2019 Bugfest Critter Cook-Off Championship Trophy to one of those two restaurants. If you can't be in the museum, you can tune in online. We'll be live streaming just like we do this show. So check out the museum's Facebook page or YouTube channel if you want to tune in to that. So... You're here tonight. Come back Friday for the cook-off and then spend the day with us on Saturday. And that might get your, your bug appetite settled for at least a month or two. And then you're going to have to come back. But let me introduce tonight's guest. You can, you can totally bug out with us here at the museum. So thanks for that. There's that was, that was always one. So... Let's bring tonight's guest up on stage. He's a professor of entomology at North Carolina State University. His name is Dr. Clyde Sorensen. Put your hands together. Let's learn about fireflies. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for coming out. So how many of you all have caught lightning bugs before? How many of you all still catch lightning bugs? All right, we're going to talk about lightning bugs and uh, try and give you a little bit of an idea of what kind of things we have going on around uh, in this wonderful state with these really cool critters. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit about the biology. I'm going to give you a little bit about some of the species we have around here. I'm going to give you some uh, insights into some of the kind of cool things um, that fireflies, lightning bugs can do. So let's go ahead and get started. And so first let's talk about just exactly what is a firefly. So fireflies are not, as Chris just stole my thunder, uh, they're not flies, and lightning bugs are not bugs, they're beetles, all right? And if you look at that picture right there, let's see if we can make that happen right here, 
You see these really cool front wings. Those are called elytra. That's the hallmark of the uh, order that beetles belong to, the coleoptera. And those elytra protect their flying wings behind. All right, so they belong to the family Lampyridae. And Lampyridae means light bearer, all right? And what's that about? Of course, they have lights. Uh, the ancient Greeks called them uh, Kisos Lampus, which means um, glowing butt. So <laughs> they were a little bit more prosaic about it, maybe. Um, they're real closely related to a lot of other beetles that you might be familiar with, click beetles, um, uh, uh, some of the, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the others, some of the leaf beetles. So they're fairly close related to some other beetles you might be familiar with. And they're also related to a really weird little group of beetles that we'll talk a little bit about later called the fingodids or the glowworms. And while we're going to be focusing on fireflies, lightning bugs, now how many of y'all call them lightning bugs? How many of y'all call them fireflies? You're probably not from around here, right? Because most of the folks around here call them lightning bugs. Every time I call them fireflies on one of these things or in an article, all my friends give me grief because I'm not calling them the right things. But anyway, um, we're going to uh, 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 try and, and give you a little bit more information about some of these other insects that glow as well. So, all right, these are the pieces and parts of a firefly. Uh, notice they've got real prominent antenna. What do, what do insects do with their antennae? Anybody, anybody know? So the antenna on an insect is actually its nose. That's what it uses for olfaction. Um, they have compound eyes. The males have bigger compound eyes than the females. Why do you reckon that is? They're looking for females. That's right. That's their whole point in life. A little shield right behind their head called the pronotum. And for fireflies, that's an important piece to be able to recognize because it helps you identify how it's shaped, how it's colored, helps you identify different species. Right behind that, there's a little tiny uh, triangular thing called a scutellum. That's also useful in identifying. And then the elytra, and some of them have a little fold in the elytra. All those things can help you sort them out. The really cool uh, little beetles, compared to most other beetles, are kind of soft. Their wings are kind of soft and leathery rather than real hard. Um, and they're really, uh, really just kind of enchanting just to look at when they're not doing the special thing that they do. And one thing that you can uh, notice on most fireflies is, is that pronotum, that shield behind the head, oftentimes covers their head when you look at them from above. And that helps you separate them from some of the other beetles that they're related to. All right, so how many species of fireflies are there? In the world, there are probably maybe 2,000 to 2,500 species. That's a lot. Compared to some of the other groups of animals you're, com you're, you're, you're familiar with, that's a lot of species. In North America, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 170. And I say somewhere in the neighborhood because we don't really know how many species of fireflies there actually are in North America. We're finding new ones all the time. Insects are really hard sometimes to sort out, partly because they're really little and partly because a lot of them look a whole lot like each other. But fireflies make it even more difficult because a lot of times species tell themselves apart, not by how they look or anything particular in the way they're shaped, but how they use their lights. And it's really tough to try and decode what they're saying and make sense of, of the different species. So how many in North Carolina? In North Carolina, we have somewhere between 30 and 50 species of fireflies. How many of y'all had any idea there were that many different kinds of fireflies in North Carolina? Give you an idea of how diverse they are. In my little backyard in north of Clayton, North Carolina, about 20 miles from here, I have at least eight species, maybe 10 species of fireflies that I've identified so far, and I haven't figured them all out. And that's just one, one backyard. So if we look at some of the important uh, groups of fireflies in North Carolina, there are four genuses, genera, 
gen, genus is the genus is the correct singular, genera is the correct plural. But I'm from Stanley County, so sometimes I'll say stupid stuff like genuses. Anyway, the one that you're probably most familiar with is a, is a genus called Photinus. And this is what the Photinus fireflies look like. That's also what I showed you in earlier pictures. Photinus are the most common. We're gonna, I'll show you in a moment um, one that you should be very familiar with. It's probably the most common firefly in most of eastern North America. So Photinus is, is important. There's another group called Photurus, and this is a Photurus firefly. Photurus are bigger. They usually have stripes on their elytra. They do some really weird things I'm going to tell you about in just a few minutes. Another genus that's kind of significant around here is Pyracmena. These are probably the biggest fireflies we have in North Carolina. A lot of these guys like to fly really high up. A lot of them have a red or orange light, and it looks like a flash, a, a red flash bulb going off in the treetop. And a lot of these also fly real early in the spring. And then the fourth genus of uh, fireflies that is kind of note, note, noteworthy in North Car Carolina is uh, Phosius, and so yeah, that's a beer advertisement, actually. Anyway, we'll talk more about them in a little bit. So. An important thing to know about fireflies is that not all fireflies are lightning bugs. Not all fireflies are lightning bugs. About a quarter of the species of the insects that we call fireflies or lightning bugs actually don't have light organs. And they don't fly at night, they fly during the day. And they look sort of like regular fireflies, um, but they don't use light for their communication. Most of them rely on pheromones, like most other insects do for communication. And this is one that we have right around here. In fact, that's my finger in my backyard with one of these day flying uh, fireflies. They do share a lot of other things in common with the night flying fireflies. And I'm hoping some of your questions uh, will get at some of those things that they share in common a little later. Another important thing to know is not all fireflies are even fireflies. All right, there are lots of other insects that mimic fireflies. And so there's a soldier beetle, a cantharid, that's one that's actually kind of closely related to the fireflies. Looks a whole lot like a lightning bug, does it not? And there's a longhorn beetle, a wood boring uh, longhorn beetle that looks an awful lot like a firefly. There's a little ground beetle that looks like a firefly. And there's a click beetle that looks like a firefly. Now, why do you reckon they all look like fireflies? Just because it's cool to look like a firefly? Well, it is cool to look like a firefly, but that's not the reason. And I'll get to the reason why they do this a little bit later. But the most important thing to note is that fireflies are nasty. They look beautiful, but they taste nasty. In fact, I have a friend, of uh, uh, one of the kids that I work with at school, one of our students, who admitted that one time he put one of these things in his mouth, probably after a few beers, and his mouth was numb for an hour after he did that. So what I'm telling y'all is don't do his experiment, take his word for it, all right? So they mimic fireflies because fireflies, as it turns out, are nasty, but we'll talk more about that in a second. All right, so everybody's... Uh, into fireflies mostly because they produce light, which is kind of an interesting thing for an animal to do. There's not a whole lot of animals that have that ability, so that's what makes them cool is they produce light. And what's cool about the light is, well, it's cool light. It generates no heat in its production. It's a completely chemical process, and almost all of the energy that goes into the light producing system comes out as light. Compared to all the different ways we make light, this is pretty remarkable. So an incandescent bulb, about 80 or 95 percent of the energy that goes into an incandescent bulb goes away as heat. Even fluorescent tubes, it's about 80 percent. Even LEDs are not as efficient as fireflies. And what they use to make their light, uh, well, a couple different things you have to have. You have to have chemicals called luciferins, and with the luciferins, you need oxygen, 
The chemical reaction requires oxygen. It requires a metabolic energy source, and that's ATP. That's what drives all living cells. And it really importantly requires this chemical here called luciferinase. And luciferinase is the enzyme that catalyzes the production of light. Different luciferins, different luciferinases make different colors of light. So some fireflies are green, some fireflies are yellow, some are kind of orange or red. Some of them might look blue, but that might also actually be an optical illusion. We'll talk about that in a little bit as well. All right. So this is a, not a firefly. This is a relative of the fireflies. It also makes light. Has anybody ever seen a creature that looks like this? It's a glow worm. This is actually another kind of beetle. This is an adult female. Does it look like an adult female? Does, you can't tell looking at it just that it's female, but it, does it look like an adult? No. So this is a weird um, beetle where the adult females are larva form. So they, they look an awful lot like larvae. And one of the other common names for these is railroad worms. You may have heard that term. So they're cool because they make light like their kin, the fireflies. This is a picture I took in my bathroom on the floor at 2 o'clock in the morning one time. <laughs> and this is a cool picture because it's actually two exposures. I took a a timed exposure with a flash exposure on top of it. So I set the camera on a tripod and I took an exposure for five seconds and then I had the flash go off. And so that shows you what the critter looks like laying on the floor, but it also shows you the green where it's glowing. But if you want to know what it really looks like glowing, that's the same exact animal laying on the floor. So this is a weird insect in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the things that's weird about it is it keeps its lights on. They call them railroad worms because it looks like a little subway car going through the forest floor. All right? And uh, they're really neat. They occur around here. You have to have a really dark night and a good, rich hardwood forest um, to look for them in, but they're around here. They're really neat. Another really cool thing about them, before we go back to fireflies, is that the males don't look like it should work, okay? It doesn't look like it should work. There's the female, all right? And there's the male. <laughs> and the females, by the way, the adult females are this long. They're impressive animals. They're just absolutely, it's a, it's a cause for celebration to find one. They're so spectacular. And the males are only about this long. The males glow for just about 30 seconds after they emerge from their pupil case, and then they quit glowing forever. And it, I still yet have not been able to figure out how it works. But in any case, it works because there's still glowworms around. All right, back to fireflies. So why do fireflies um, glow? And how, and how do they make their living? Most fireflies, and we'll talk about the why in just a minute. Most fireflies make their living as predators on other uh, invertebrates. All right. So the larvae are actually little killers. They live in the soil or under the soil, uh, uh, the leaf litter on top of the soil. A lot of them specialize in things like earthworms uh, or snails or slugs. We're talking about little animals that when they're fully grown might only be this long, killing earthworms that are this long and then feeding on them for a week, or killing snails this big and feeding on them for a week. They're, they're just little assassins. And they're really cool uh, in, in the different ways they acquire their prey. Most adults, however, don't feed. Fireflies, depending on the species, uh, require specific habitats. Some of them are uh, tightly attached to deep woodland habitats, to marshland habitats, to grasslands. In those 30 or 40 species that we have in North Carolina, some you will only find in specific habitats. A lot of them require uh, mature native forests. All right. 
a lot of the invasive plants that we've accidentally introduced may have a negative impact on them, and that's something we'll talk about maybe a bit later. Uh, and many of the species, just like we saw with the glowworms just a moment ago, the females are larva form and don't have wings, and that has a big implication for how persistent they are in the landscape. We'll talk about that again a little bit later. And again, most of the species don't feed as adults, with one really notable exception that's kind of fun, and we'll talk about in just a few minutes. So the, the question is, how long do the adults live? So most of the adults probably live in the neighborhood of two to three weeks. So they store enough energy as larvae to get them through their adult phase. Um, but the, the primary uh, goal of the adult is simply pro procreation. And so they focus all their energies into finding mates. And even though we talked about light, all the energy going into the light production system um, coming back out as light, it's very efficient. And that way it does take metabolic energy for them to, to do that. So yeah, most of them will live a couple weeks, maybe. Very few of them live much longer than that. All right, so this is one of those larva form females, by the way. Does it look like a firefly or a lightning bug? In most species that use lights, both the males and the females have light organs. But the light organs are organized differently. Usually on the females, they're much smaller. Um, and we'll talk about why that might be in just a minute. All right, so uh, what is with the light? What are, they, what are they doing with light? Why do they make light anyway? Yeah, well, they use light, of course, for communication. And in most firefly species, all the communication they're interested in Conducting has to do with sex. That's all, that's what they're after. They're after finding a mate uh, from the opposite sex and getting together and uh, making sure that there are more fireflies next year. So, again, I said different genera have different color lights, more or less. Uh, each species within a genus has its own singling system. And I'm going to show you some examples. Hopefully, you'll be able to see them. My videos may or may not be all that uh, apparent, but we'll try. So in a given species, the males have a signal that they make. And in most species, the way it works is the males are flying around. They're doing the risky stuff. The risky stuff is flying around where things might get you. They're flying around, and they're making their species flash. The females, on the other hand, are sitting on the ground or in vegetation in a fairly safe place watching for the males. And if they see a male go by making their species signal and real importantly doing a good job of it, it can't just be any old Joe, it's got to be a good guy. If they see one go by that's making their signal and doing it well, they'll flash the female signal back at the male. He'll see it with his giant compound eyes, and he'll start flying her direction. They reciprocally flash back and forth, back and forth until he gets close enough to land very close to her, and he'll run over there, they'll shake hands, and then they'll go to mating. And sometimes, this is a little video of it right here, Sometimes they will stay coupled for many, many hours. By the way, what's going on here is there's a mated pair of the most common species we have around here. And there's a very, very frustrated additional male trying to figure out how he came so late to the game. Anyway, so they stay hooked up for long periods of time. And there's a real important reason for that. While they're copulating, while they're mating, the male in many of these species is providing the female with a really large, what we call a nuptial gift, a big packet of protein and other stuff that the female can use to protect herself and also to make more eggs. So that's kind of a cool thing. All right, so probably the most common firefly around here, the one that you're most familiar with, is a species called Photinus paralis. This is the one that almost everybody has in their backyard 
flies over the grass right after dusk, about this far off the ground. Hopefully this will work. You'll have to watch this very carefully because um, we see firefly light really well. We've got good eyes. Cameras do not pick up firefly light nearly as well, so you've got to watch my videos carefully. All these, by the way, came from my yard. So in the middle, there should be a green flash, and then it should keep coming closer as we progress. Hopefully, it's there. All right? And if you notice, that firefly, that male, about every four or five seconds is making a little swoop with his green light, a little swoop. You see it? That's why we call him the Big Dipper. So this is the, the Big Dipper. The males make a little swoop like that. The females are on the ground watching. If they see a male doing it right, about a, a second and a half or two seconds after he flashes, they'll make a half second flash, and that's the signal that calls him down. All right? So that's the one that you're probably most familiar with. It's probably the most common firefly in eastern North America. That's the Big Dipper. And that's what he looks like, by the way. Another one that occurs in my yard, and you're going to have to watch real carefully on this one, is another Photinus species called uh, Consanguinus. And Consanguinus, the sort of unofficial common name for it, is the double tap. So where the Big Dipper was doing this for a second, this one goes bat, bat, and then it flies for several seconds, and then it goes bat, bat again. So let's see if we can maybe see that. It'll start off in the corner, the lower uh, left corner, and go towards the other side. But you'll see a double flash. This one flies right after it gets fully dark. It only flies for 20 minutes a night, and then it quits. So. What I'm getting at is there's a different flash pattern. There's a different time at night. A lot of times there's a different elevation that they're using to try and make sure they don't accidentally get tangled up with somebody of the wrong species. All right? The third one I'll show you real quickly. This is going to be, uh, and by the way, that's what consanguinous looks like. Looks very similar to, to uh, paralysis. The third one I'll show you is uh, a different genus. This is Photurus. Uh, this is Photurus frontalis. And the unofficial common name for it is the snappy sink. And this is a really special firefly. Again, you're going to have to watch very carefully to see the flashes. But this one just keeps flashing. So if you'll watch and you'll notice if you're careful that there are multiple ones flashing and they're doing something interesting again very difficult to see because my cameras are not as good as my eye but this one just keeps flashing flash 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 about this far off the ground and he'll start up when it gets fully dark and sometimes they're still flying at midnight and they're still flash 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 and we call it the, the snappy sink because this is one of the two species in North America that under high population levels synchronizes. And in my backyard, I get 10 or 15 or 20 at a time, which is cool. They synchronize for maybe 30 seconds. But when you get real high populations of them, they synchronize for hours. And so I've got something in the works y'all need to keep your ears uh, peeled for because maybe in a year we're going to have a place where we can see this um, phenomenon of these synchronous fireflies. So each one of these species has its own flash pattern, flies its own flash um, time, its own height, and all that is to try and keep them from making mistakes. There are lots of variations. Some species have multiple flash patterns, which gets confusing. Um, some uh, do other things with their lights. Well, what are some of those other things? I'll tell you about that in just a second. Now, why do fire, have you all caught fireflies, put them in a jar? You ever notice that a jar has kind of a weird smell to it? This is probably another good indication that they're not good to put in your mouth, that weird smell. Well, that, that smell may be related to some of the chemicals that they produce to protect themselves from predators. 
Lots of fireflies, particularly photinous fireflies, produce these chemi chemicals called luci lucibufigans. Lucibufigan. I got to say it right here, right here. Lucibufigan, which is simply a way of saying they make light and they make a chemical that's very close to the toxins that toads make. So they're 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 as noxious as toads, and you know some toads are really chemically noxious. So. Those lucibufigans protect most fireflies from many predators, but not from all predators. Some spiders, they don't care. They just eat them. Maybe they get a little high, a little stoned, and they eat another one. But um, So again, really closely related to those that are produced by toads. Makes them very distasteful. Um, they may make other defensive chemicals. Now, the important thing to know is that not all fireflies make these chemicals. All right, and um, another thing that they do with these toxins that they make is they use them in another defensive strategy called reflexive bleeding. So if you catch one, particularly um, uh, if it's uh, uh, um, kind of mishandled or handled roughly, it'll just start bleeding from its legs or like you see right here on this one. That little, is it going to work for me here? That little bubble right between its legs, that's blood that it's leaked out. And that blood has those lucibufigans in it. And so anybody that's eating it's going to get that stuff all over its tongue and its mouth. And it's a good signal for you to just let it go. All right? Other beetles do this, by the way, too. How many of y'all have ever had ladybugs in your house? All right? And they're walking up the wall. And you want to get rid of that ladybug and you try and brush it off and you end up with an orange smear, that's reflexive bleeding too. Same kind of thing going on. All right, so that's one thing they do with them. Now, we've got some making lucibufigans. We have some that kind of bleed on you to get you to let them go. I said something weird about Photurus though a little while ago. Photurus is that genus of the big ones that often have stripes. Faturus doesn't make lucibufigans, all right? But they want lucibufigans, all right? So there's a Faturus. And a lot of these female Faturus, because they want those lucibufigans, are predaceous. And they do something very kind of diabolical. Virgin Faturus behave like a regular firefly should. They go ahead and they watch for their males and they make the appropriate flash signal, and they call him down, and everything works out just like it's supposed to work out, and they mate. After they mate, the next night, instead of watching for males of their own species, they watch for males of, Fotur of, for of Photinus, all right? So they sit there, and they watch for Photinus, and when they see a male Photinus, they mimic a female Photinus. And that poor old male, he's like, my lucky night, she's answering back. He flies down, he runs over to shake hands, and she eats him. And she eats him to harvest the lucibufigans that he has in his body. And then she uses those chemicals to protect herself and her eggs from spiders and other predators. We call them the femme fatales, all right? Really, really kind of cool, really kind of diabolical. Some of the uh, Faturus females are actually agile enough, they'll actually cruise around in the air and catch them out of midair. Or they'll steal them from spider webs to get those chemicals. So it's really kind of neat. Question? So they, they, they focus on Photinus and other species that produce those lucibufigans. His question was, do they only hunt Photinus? Far as I know, pretty much Photinus, because Photinus is the most common night flying uh, genus most of the time. Well, that's a very dangerous thing to say. Anyway, okay, never mind. All right, some other important phenomena for y'all to be aware of. Another uh, one that's really, really cool is Photinus carolinus. This is the famous synchronous firefly that, that is so uh, well known in. Um, 
Great Smoky Mountains National Park at Elkmont. Um, this is a firefly that's pretty much restricted to the Appalachians, but it occurs from Georgia all the way to Pennsylvania. Uh, I don't know if y'all got wind of it, but uh, I was really, really fortunate back in June. I was up at Grandfather Mountain to do a different program, and they let me stay up there, and I found that there are large populations of uh, Photinus carolinus at Grandfather, so that may end up being another place to see them. So what's so spectacular about them? If you will, let's go ahead and look at the video real quickly. This was with a much better camera than my camera. So this is another one that under high population densities they synchronize. So when they're under high population levels, they synchronize. This is a species where the males flash eight or nine times and then they go dark for several seconds. And what's synchronous is actually the dark periods. But when you see several hundred, maybe a thousand fireflies all around you doing this, it's a pretty mystical kind of experience. All right. We can go on to the next. So that's this, the mountain synchronous fireflies. I told you about Faturus frontalis. Faturus frontalis does a similar thing in the coastal areas. So you can go to Congaree National Park in South Carolina and see uh, frontalis doing the same kind of thing. Hopefully next year you'll have someplace a whole lot closer than Congaree National Park to see that if things go well. All right. There we go. Another really cool uh, phenomenon is this species. This is the blue ghost. I put the beer advertisement up earlier, but this is actually the firefly. This is one of those where the females are larviform. So that picture in the lower left is a male and a female. Blue ghosts are tiny. The males are only about this long, maybe a little over a quarter inch long. And what's cool about them is they have a bluish green light. They fly about two feet off the ground, but instead of flashing, they keep their light on. And so when you encounter a large population of blue ghosts, what you see is these little trails going through the forest. And when you get close to them, they turn off. So it's like chasing fairies. You can't see what's doing it, but there's all these little blue lights going through. And there's another short video that we can look at that might give you a little indication of that. Blue ghost in the rainstorm. They don't look blue, do they? They don't look blue because their light's actually not blue. It's blue green. So why do they look blue when you see them in for real? It's due to a little optical illusion. And I let's see if I can get to it. What what? That's not us. There we go. So the optical illusion is called the Perjikian effect. And what that is is when you see something that's blue-green and faint at distance, 
it shifts to the blue side of the spectrum and it looks blue even though the light's not really blue. Anyhow, who cares about that? They're really, really cool. All right, so important thing to remember about fireflies is habitat is key. You don't have fireflies if you don't have good habitat. There's habitat for Photinus pyralis for the Big Dipper. There's habitat for Photinus carolinus, deep woods. Um, Photinus, um, I forgot which one I had related to that one. Swamps, you have uh, uh, frontalis, the uh, Photurus frontalis I was talking about. Some are associated only with the savannas. You have to have good habitat. Now, watching fireflies is a, a easy hobby to, to pick up. You all have been doing it all your lives. If you want to get more serious about it, there are things you can do. What do you need to watch fireflies? A chair. <laughs> Stopwatch if you want to keep track of the flashes and try and identify the species. That can be helpful. A net if you want to catch them after you've looked at their flashes, right? Maybe a pleasant, refreshing beverage of some sort or another. That might be, that might be useful. And you might need a red or blue headlamp. You don't want to use a regular flashlight or a white light because it turns them off. They'll stop flashing if you hit them with a flashlight. So if we have a little time later, I'll tell you a little story about whether it should be a red or a blue headlamp. And you might want a little pen light, a tiny little pen light, because you can actually call fireflies to you if you know the, if you know the language. All right, real quickly, threats to fireflies. Um, a lot of fireflies are not terribly mobile. They can't go long distances, especially those with the larva form females. They can't disperse any further than those females can uh, crawl. If you destroy habitat that has a population of them in there, you're not going to get them back. Um, habitat loss and fragmentation is probably the biggest threat to fireflies. Another threat I mentioned earlier is non-native plants. If it obstructs the forest floor like uh, Japanese stilt grass does. You all might be familiar with that. That can get in the way of firefly um, mating. Light pollution, street lights, bad for fireflies. Porch lights can be bad for fireflies. And of course, insecticides. So there are a number of threats, but if we want to pr protect them, preserve them, the, mess, the most important thing we need to do is preserve that habitat, not disturb that habitat. And again, remember, most of the larvae are subterranean or live under the leaf litter. If you disturb that habitat while they're in there, you can kill them. So protecting habitats paramount and reducing insecticide use is paramount. All right. Um, that's pretty much all I have in terms of my formal presentation. So I guess now we can maybe take some questions. Let's and give him a round of applause. So the way the Q&A section works is I've got the mic, Katie back there has a microphone, wave at us, we'll bring a microphone to you and we'll get to as many questions as we have time for. So uh, keep waving at us, we will try to get to as many as we can. Really, really interesting, oh, thank great. you. Um, so it seems like the, um, the males putting out the light is um, to initiate a pattern of sexual selection. Um, and, and the females select. Um, I guess my question is um, how... How does the quality of the light, how does the quality of the male's light um, indicate the male's potential for um, kind of reproductive being a quality? Good, being a fit mate. Yeah. So. The exact timing of the signal, the intensity of the signal, um, there are a lot of little traits like that that they're very subtle to us but that the females pick up on. Now an interesting thing to note is that early in the season the females are real picky and they're very, very selective but as it gets later in the season and um, males become scarcer because well they've kind of worn themselves out the males become very picky, and the females have to prove themselves to be good mates. So, but those signals are very subtle. So, how frequent? Um, you know, is it exactly timed right? Is the intensity just right? Is he doing what he's supposed to be doing in terms of 
elevation off the ground. All those kinds of things can lead to I'm not quite sure. Oh, so so the 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 quality of that signal is an indication of fitness. It's just like, you know, the best peacocks have the biggest tails, right? So the better display, the 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 the, the, the stronger that display is, the more fit that display is, the more that likely indicates a, a high quality male. But one that's kind of flickering and kind of half-hearted, you know, he probably is not he's not going to be a very good Father, he's probably not going to give you a very good nuptial gift. That's a real important consideration. Question here: um, Is the male capable of more than one nuptial gift, and where does she, the female place her eggs? So, uh, the, the second question first: The females put their eggs in the soil. Some females guard their eggs until they hatch, and then they die. So, different species have different behaviors related to that, um, and. Uh, I'm not certain. I think a male will attempt to make multiple nuptial gifts, but um, in some species, it's just a massive investment of energy, and he probably doesn't have the resources, um, given that he's not eating anything, to make too many of them before he's just done, spent, used up, no good anymore. Yeah. Uh, decades ago, I remember that there were some... Um, some folklore in the mountains that there were certain valleys or certain mountains that were had these mysterious uh, things, and I'm now thinking it's the blue ghosts. Well, you think about the brown mountain lights. Yeah. Yeah. So um, blue ghosts are spectacular if you're like from here to ten feet, twenty feet, maybe fifty feet from them, but you're not going to see them across the valley. They're just too dim. But I'm certain those first Scottish settlers that came down from Pennsylvania, they encountered these things. You know, superstitious folks from Scotland, they probably thought they were surrounded by haints, you know. So I don't know how much it contributed to Brown Mountain, but it certainly contributes to folklore. Was, was there ever a core species that all of these other species adapted from? Okay, and so... What is the uh, adaptive area i mean what makes them change so much to give you so many different species so um that that's a great question we think that fireflies originally evolved the ability to make light as what's called an episomatic signal which means i taste nasty i want you to know that i taste nasty so you don't eat me and then that ability to make light was then later co-opted for sexual communication so how do you get speciation? You have populations exploiting different habitats, um, and sometimes the what they're the difference in that habitat is very subtle for us. But that's that's what kind of the, the kind of thing that leads to speciation. And the interesting thing with fireflies is that they can speciate by changing light signals as well, and that'll end up being a, a separation mechanism. Did that did that help? Um, do males have any sense of what's a trick to eat them or an actual mate, or do they just fall for it every time? Well, they are males, so, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I don't know, I don't know, uh, there, there may be some selection um, for them to avoid it, but they only get one crack. You know, if they make a mistake one time, they're done. And so, uh, and the, I, the, that picture I showed you of the female Photurus eating the Photinus, that was on my back porch. That was right beside my back door. They're, they're really agile, really aggressive, and I don't think, you know, if they get close, they don't get away. So. Hi, I was wondering if you could tell us which light is best, the red or the blue, for watching fireflies. <laughs> All right, so um, here's the little story. We, we, I have a project uh, looking at the reproductive ecology of Venus flytraps down on the coast, and we're having a fun time with that. And we put cameras out at, um, on some flytraps a couple years ago to try and see if we could detect any insects visiting the flowers at night. 
because we had a good idea what was coming to the flowers during the day, but we didn't know what was going on at night at all. So we put these cameras out and we put little red lights on the flowers because most insects, by the way, most insects can't see red. So red looks black to them. And so we put them out. We came back the next day. We looked at our footage. And lo and behold, there are fireflies all over the flowers. And we're going, National Geographic, here we come. <laughs> most charismatic plant in the world, one of the most charismatic insects in the world, and they're interacting. We got, we got a golden story here. So we went out the next night with our red headlights to catch fireflies on Venus flytrap flowers so we could look for pollen and document that they were indeed carrying pollen. And we waited till it got good and dark. The mosquitoes came out and they about drained us of blood. And we're out there trying to catch fireflies and the fireflies are flying to our red headlights. <laughs> fireflies can see red. Blue appears to bother them less. White turns them off. Red won't shut them off, but it does attract them. So a blue headlight is probably better. And so much for National Geographic. Anyway. So what would be the adaptive significance to an individual of being a synchronous blinker? That's a great question. So why do they synchronize? When you have hundreds and hundreds of individuals in the same area, if everybody just kind of went on their own path, it would be bedlam. So we think that they synchronize, and they remember they synchronize their dark periods. We think they synchronize so everybody gets a chance to look for the girls on the ground. And if they didn't synchronize, nobody would ever get it. You know, you'd just be, be, be blinded by all your, I, I won't say buddies because they're all everybody for themselves, but um, it gives them an opportunity to try and actually do that reciprocal communication. And Normally, when you have those synchronous species, the females are vastly outnumbered on any given night by the males. So if they see a female on the ground, a lot of times there'll be like 20 of them. And they all go down, and it's just this ball of males all trying to be the guy. And so we think they synchronize to give them the chance to watch for the ladies. So the females are the ones that are attracting the males. Uh, well, that's that's clearly, that's, that's yeah, it's always in, in all of them. The females, I mean, the females, if they don't signal, the males don't know they're there. And there's another neat, uh, uh, kind of related to that, the blue ghosts. When you have a good population of them, there's a video, a, uh, a, a time-lapse photo that shows that over the course of the night, they basically cover the entire forest floor looking for the girls. And again, most of the time, on any given night, the, the females are... are far outnumbered by males. So. Yeah. Yes, sir. Why do um, females mo usually, uh, well, um, why do females, some females look like larva? So why are they larva form? Um, you know, I don't know a real good answer to that. That's a, that's like a brilliant question. You stump, you stump the guy. That's pretty good. Um, so, in in a lot of in a lot of insects, flying is a risky is a risky behavior. If you fly, somebody can get you and eat you. And so, it might be that they, that they're larva form and they stay on the ground because that's a safe kind of place for them to to pass their their adult lives. And the males are up doing the risky stuff of flying around looking for the females. Yes. I was told that there is uh, a great decrease in population of fireflies in neighborhood areas, suburban areas. Is there a reason for that or is that a... So, yeah, so fireflies are uh, certainly declining in some places. In a lot of suburban areas, one of the things that contributes to that is um, a, a lot more lighting. So the light pollution really interferes with their ability to communicate. Another uh, thing that might have an impact is the prevalence of like um, area sprays for mosquitoes. You know, um, if you want fireflies, don't have insecticides in your yard. If you have, you want fireflies and you have mosquitoes in your yard, put some repellent on. But. Um, there, a lot of these guys are quite sensitive to insecticides. That, that's not been really well characterized, 
but a lot of the insecticides that we use for that purpose are pretty toxic in general to insects, and so that's something that might contribute to that. But light, light pollution is a big factor, and habitat disruption is another big factor. Yes? So, so if the females are so outnumbered by the males, there's no guarantee that the one she really liked is the one she's going to get. Well, once they get there, she still has, she still has uh, discretion in the choice. She doesn't want to mate with a male. She won't let him do it. So, yeah. But it it does get kind of it does get kind of like a free for all at times. And you saw that with the that little short video I showed you with the male trying to horn in. You know that you know, they're they don't have they, they they all have this little brief window. They spend a year in the ground killing earthworms, and they only have two weeks to leave their genes to the next generation. So it's 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 a do or die mission. Yeah. Well, it's a do and then die mission. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit about uh, communicating with a firefly with, say, a pen light, and have you ever done it? Yeah. So you need a pen light that's got the button. That so, in other words, you don't you don't have time to click it and click it off, click it on, click it off. But if you have one of those little pen lights that has a button on it, um, so you can just kind of flash it. This works with Photinus. Uh, paralysis. You watch for the male, and you go one, two, flash for half a second. And then he'll flash back, flash half a second. So instead of chasing them all over the yard with a net or a jar, just sit there on your own tail and catch them and have them come to you. But yeah, it'll work. Little, you need a little pen light, like I said, that you can flash real quickly, because the, the female's flash only lasts a half second. Yes. Um, I have some very clever toads on my deck, and I've seen them, uh, well, they like to hang out under the porch light, and I've seen them catch uh, fireflies, and then the inside of their mouth is glowing. Uh, is that a mistake, or is that deliberate? So if you keep watching them, a lot of times you'll see them yak them right back out. <laughs> they, 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 a, a, toad, a toad's business is eating bugs any kind of insect, but if they, a lot of times, and I've seen them do it, I've seen them watch, it's, it's kind of fun to watch that, that, that little throat pass go blah, blah, and then you'll see them, yeah, yak it right back out. And, and that gooey firefly will just walk off like, you know, just everyday occurrence, so. But there are lots of, of animals that can eat fireflies. Some spiders are very vigorous um, predators, and uh, Sometimes, if a toad's hungry enough, it'll just go down the gullet, and he'll just deal with the lucibufagans later on, right? We got one back here. Yes. So, so you're obviously able to do a lot of research from your backyard, but I'm wondering, can researchers study fireflies in the laboratory? So they're really, really hard to raise. They're, you know, they're predators. They live in the soil, so it's hard to, to rear them. Uh, as a colonial animal in the in the in the lab, but there are lots of folks doing some really cool lab work with it. In fact, on Saturday uh, at 1:30, uh, a lady named uh, Sarah uh, Lewis is going to be here. She's from Tufts University, and she's done a tremendous amount of work to understand things like nuptial gifts and signaling systems and all. And so she may be able, if you come to that, you you may get some insight into some of those really cool things that some people are doing. My my mission in the next couple of years here is just to try and understand better what fireflies we have around and where they're distributed. Uh, the frontalis I was talking about, I'm excited about that because um, if I have 10 or 15 or 20 in my backyard at the head of my little pond in my little suburban neighborhood, a place like Hal Woods, y'all familiar with Hal Woods, anybody? For me, with Howe Woods down in Johnston County, so owned by uh, Johnston Community College, it's 2,000 acres of bottomland hardwood forest, and if they're there, it's going to be awesome. And so I'm. That's one of my. That's one of my missions next next spring is to is to see if they're there. I went down there late this year, and I didn't see big numbers of frontalis, but there was another species of a tourist, and there were literally tens of thousands of them in the tree canopy. And even though they weren't synchronous, we, we still had a large time watching them. Let me get a microphone yeah, to you. Get a mic to you. Yeah. Uh, a couple questions about the larvae. Yep. Uh, one, do they, since they're predatory, do they ever eat each other? 
and is that one of the reasons they're hard to raise? And two, do they have, do they taste as bad as larvae? So or are they? You, so the do they make do they make the protective chemicals as larvae? I think some of them do. Um, do they eat each other? Almost certainly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you know the larvae don't have really good eyes. They have little. Um, simple eyes that allow them to see some things, allow them to see light and dark and all that, but I think if they encounter something soft body, they're going to stick their little fangs in it and it's going to be dead. And if it's, uh, if it's good enough, they'll go ahead and eat it. If not, they'll go find something else to kill. Yeah. Where would you go to see a glow worm? I've never seen one. So, um, they're all around here. They're not, they're never really, really abundant, but the best way to find one is to get into a a really nice, rich hardwood forest on a dark night and walk and just look for a little green light on the ground. And um, uh, I do a part of a summer camp with the Fish and Wildlife undergraduates every summer up at Hill Forest, which is north of Durham. And we had about a 12 year st stretch where we found at least one every year the night that I was up there. Now the last three three years we've come up blank. I don't know why, but um, they're out there. They're not terribly abundant, but they're out there. And so if you get in good, rich, dark woods on a trail maybe and just no lights, you turn a light on, you kill your night vision, you'll not see them. Um, but just ease along through the woods and watch for that green light on the ground. And when you find one, it'll blow you away, guarantee it. Hello, um, thank you, this is a great presentation. Is there any data that relates um, energy expenditure on uh, bioluminescence uh, and energy expenditure on flight? Which? Uh, oh, flight's far and away much more energy intensive, yeah. There's no doubt that, that, that they're, they're spending, expending more of their energy flying around than they are making the light. But they're, they're using energy for both those processes, to be sure. Thank you. Let's give him one more round of applause. Thank you all very much. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Enjoyed it. So, hey, that was awesome, right? And you're all going to go home, sit outside, and look for fireflies now, right? See if you can find some lightning bugs. Hey, thanks for coming out to the Science Cafe. Don't forget, tomorrow we've got the Critter Cook-Off, 11 a.m. in the atrium right behind me. All day Saturday, bug fest. Don't miss it. I hope we'll see you again here real soon at the museum. Good night, everybody.